everybody. I'm so excited to be doing this Wednesday webinar, the ABCs of Effective Advocacy. I'm just so impressed with the number of people that signed up and that are on the line. And um, thank you so much for attending. So um, I want to really talk about advocacy in action. And in order to be a really good advocate, you really need to understand all the steps of what I'm gonna call a uh, power analysis. And we're gonna go through those in this session today. So the first thing you have to do is really map out your advocacy strategy from A to Z. And um, you have to figure out what it is you wanna change, or in some cases, what do you wanna stop from changing? Um, that applies to things like um, changing drug policy to legalize drugs um, and, and other things. For the most part, I'm gonna focus on what you want to change, but you can use this exact process to figure out how to organize and mobilize to stop laws and policies from changing that would negatively impact what we do in prevention. So what do you want to change? Is it a law? Is it a regulation? Is it a, a policy? Is it a, a funding issue? Um, whatever it is, you really need to collect facts, which really are the data, to be able to best make your case to decision makers in a way that will be really understandable to them, but also based on science and evidence and factual information. So first thing you need to do is gather the data, the data and analysis that you need to be able to make your case to change whatever it is you wanna change or to argue against a change that would be detrimental. So you need to figure out why is the change needed um, and you're going to document either the extent of a problem that you're facing um, and you're gonna do that by using facts, figures and anecdotes to document that the change that you're looking to have happen is really needed and as local as possible for you to make the data if this is something that you're trying to do at the local or state level, that makes a difference. So let me just give you some examples here. Age of initiation, um, is really important um, when we are dealing with prevention because substance use preventions are pediatric onset diseases. All of you guys know this, but you know, 90% of substance use disorders uh, are initiated before people are 18. Most of it way before 18, the earlier and the heavier someone uses, the more likely they are to develop problems later. Of youth who begin drinking before age 15, 40% were classified as dependent later in life, and children who first smoke marijuana under the age of 14 are more than five times as likely to have a substance use disorder. Why is this important? This is helping to make the general case that substance use prevention is critically important if we want to stop downstream problems of substance use disorders and the associated issues with those later on in life. Okay. Prevention is cost effective. Every dollar invested in prevention saves communities between two and twenty dollars. This is one study. Other studies say that it saves every dollar invested saves up to seven in criminal justice and substance use treatment costs. There are a number of studies. We picked this one because the range from two to twenty twenty is sort of the highest number that we have come up with. Investments in prevention program with state states and local governments one point three billion including um, over a billion in education costs within two years. That comes from an old SAMHSA study, but it's the best cost benefit that we have. For the most part, that's based on school-based programs, but still it makes the case that we need to invest in the front end and greater investments in prevention would reduce costs related to substance use by about 33.5 billion and preserve quality of life over a lifetime valued at 65 billion. This is really important. People don't really realize how cost-effective prevention is and that in fact, investments in prevention pay very long-term dividends, but a lot of money can be saved downstream when we invest upstream. Um, also, we all know that the 
adolescent brain doesn't really stop developing into somewhere in your mid to late 20s. But elected officials don't necessarily understand that. And that's something else. And a lot of parents don't understand that. This is something else that I think it's very important to educate people about. Mixing substances into the adolescent brain is really, it's contraindicated, it's problematical, and it um, it causes addiction and a host of other um, mental health and other related issues. So we really need to put off the age of initiation as long as we possibly can for all substances. Okay, this is the, um, the 2020 through 22 monitoring the future study. And the important thing for this, this is um, annual prevalence among 12th graders. Um, alcohol is the number one substance that is um, used by, by kids, followed by vaping and um, marijuana, and then vaping marijuana. I mean, it's very, very, very interesting that, you know, most people think that the biggest issue is, is fentanyl, which it is for people who are heavily using, but for kids who are initiating, if we're not dealing with alcohol, marijuana, and vaping nicotine and marijuana, we're not gonna get to where we wanna go. So this is another thing that I think is extremely important to share with people, like what is it that kids are actually using and initiating with? So now that you've sort of collected some data, you need to reduce it to one page. Decision makers are extremely busy as are their staffs. They have small attention spans. They're responsible for a tremendous amount of issues and giving them one pagers that make your case is the absolute best way to give them the data that you want to share with them. So this is a one pager on girls, women and alcohol um, that really makes the case that women are starting to binge drink a lot more than they did. There are major health consequences um, for women using alcohol that most people are not really aware of. Um, for instance, women who drink a bit are at much higher risk for breast cancer, heart disease, and um, another a number of other important health consequences. Um, this is one on alcohol outlet density, um, and obviously this is a zoning type issue at the local level and the state level, but very important. And so this is you know an environmental strategy where they sort of put all of this on one one page to take to decision makers if in fact you're interested in limiting alcohol outlet density. Um, this is interesting. It's an, an example from um, the North Coastal Prevention Coalition. They had a STOP Act grant, and what they were able to do was figure out how kids were getting alcohol in their community. And by far, the biggest way kids were accessing was from house parties and family and friends. Why is this important? Because clubs and restaurants were like 5%. House parties were almost 80%. So if you're gonna pick strategies that you wanna implement, they need to be based on local conditions and local data. So they were able to use this to get um, a local host ordinance passed in their town by showing how kids were really accessing alcohol in their community. Uh, this is something I wanna say thank you to Chris Dorn. We've taken those of you who are drug-free communities coalitions, the data that you get back from the DFC management evaluation system and turned it into one pagers where you can see the declines really clearly with those big red arrows. This has worked for us amazingly well on Capitol Hill to share the outcomes of drug-free communities coalitions. Um, and you can see you know, alcohol down almost 80%, uh, tobacco down 82%. This makes it really clear that this is Anderson County, Tennessee, that they've reduced use tremendously across both middle and high school students um, for all the substances that the drug-free communities grantees are asked to collect data on amazing one pager and we've turned all of the data into this type of a one pager to take to the hill because it's really easy to see and understand the impact of prevention. Um, so some questions to consider for your one pagers where you're reducing your data and information. 
One, you have to make sure the data is accurate. Absolutely. And everything that you do needs to be cited. Very, very, very important. You sort of lose your credibility right away if you go in with inaccurate data. The other thing is the data accessible and understandable. I think in all of the one pages I just showed you, the answer is yes. Somebody very quickly can glance at the one pager and understand exactly what we're trying to tell them. Um, and is the data actionable? Yes. You know, do we want to go in and ask that they fully fund the drug free communities program based on the amazing outcomes that they can see across all substances and all grade levels? Um, absolutely. So you have to make sure that the data matches back to what it is that you're trying to accomplish uh, and what you're trying to get changed. Um, anecdotes. So the data is extremely important. You cannot go in without data, but you need to put a face on the data. You need to make the data resonate and you can do that with stories. So anecdotes are really stories. Anecdotes put a face on the data through stories that make it relevant and relatable. This is what sort of tugs at the heartstrings of people when you go in with youth or people in recovery, depending on what it is you're tr trying to do. Uh, people who have lost children uh, and loved ones to overdoses. You need to bring the people in to put the face on your data and to explain why it matters to them, to regular people, and why it should matter to decision makers. So anecdotes really matter. They make the data resonate. They make the data human. And they really make people, quote, get it. But anecdotes are necessary but not sufficient. You can't only go in with anecdotal evidence and people telling stories. You've got to marry the two together. So you have your data, and then you back it up with the anecdotes by people with lived experience, kids, parents, whoever it is you're bringing in, medical community, police, um, they're the ones who are gonna put a face on the data for you, really critically important. Okay, the next thing we need to do is identify and engage who our allies are gonna be. Who are the people in the community that agree that underage drinking is a really big problem and that we really need to do more about it, both policy-wise and funding-wise. So um, you need to figure out who you're gonna recruit to be in your advocacy coalition. This is a little bit different than the 12 sectors in your coalition. Those people are critically important and always need to be involved, but there are other people who maybe aren't already in your coalition or a part of your coalition who would be really interested in whatever issue is you're pushing. And you need to sort of figure out how you're gonna recruit additional people in addition to your 12 sector reps who would be interested in helping you get the change that you're interested in having happen, actually happen. So who are your potential allies? Parents, parent groups, the faith community, a lot of these people are already in your coalition but you can go broader. You know, maybe you have one or two faith leaders and they can bring in the rest of the faith community, public health groups, prevention and treatment groups, law enforcement. A lot of these people you already have in your coalition. Sometimes you don't have the consumer safety groups. I'm finding on the, um, the synthetic cannabinoid issue and the alcohol issue, the Consumer Federation of America has been extremely helpful. They're usually not at the table. Um, numbers of youth serving organizations. Um, and we found working on the, um, the farm bill, synthetic cannabinoid issue, that the Farm Bureau people are really interested in helping youth stay um, drug free. And we're going to have a session at Forum on how to get groups like that involved in your coalition, especially on issues where you have a joint interest, but that maybe they've never been involved in your coalition before. Um, so what's their shared interest in this and how are you gonna convince them to join? Well, if people care about youth and safety and reducing um, car accidents related to underage drinking um, and, and other issues, um, you need to figure out who else would have a shared interest in this that's not already at your table 
And then how are you going to convince them to join based on your data, your anecdotes, um, and other people who are already in the coalition that maybe can bring them along um, because this is an issue that maybe they would care greatly about as well. So you need to really connect the dots for the people you'd like to have in your advocacy coalition for them so that they understand why they should care about this issue and join in any way possible. They could sign on to a letter. They could be willing to go to a meeting when we're going to get to setting up meetings. Um, th there's a lot that they can do if they understand that this is something that they should help with and care a lot about. Um, the next question is, do you have champions in the system where you'd like to make the change, whether it's the state legislature, the federal legislature, your county commission, the zoning board, the school board. Um, do you know people in the system where you want to make the change? Um, and how are you going to get to those people? That's the next thing we're going to talk about. So who are you going to ask to help you recruit champions? Um, people who know your elected officials who are in the coalition, people who have donated money to um, the people, the elected officials, people who go to church with them, people who have kids in the same grade as them. You need to figure out who's connected to the people you're trying to get to. And then if you need help getting to them, ask those people to help you. And a lot of you have your own connections with your locally elected and state elected representatives. And so if you do, you don't actually have to ask someone else to help you recruit champions, but it never hurts to have as many people as possible involved in trying to get people in the system where you can get this actually changed, where you're trying to get changed, um, help you get people in the system who are gonna be carrying the legislation or the policy change for you. So you need to engage champions. And now we're gonna get up to setting up meetings with your potential legislative champions to brief them on the general issue. This is still education. You're meeting with people to share the extent of the problem from your data, to put a face on it with your anecdotes, to tell them that something needs to change um, and to get them to understand that there's an issue that's really important why it needs to change and what needs to change. So you need to know and fully understand the process for getting whatever it is you want done, done. This is the legislative process at the federal government. Every state legislature works a little differently. I think all of you know how your county governments um, and your city councils work, but it's really important to know the process because if you come in too late in the session, you're not gonna get what you need to have happen. Um, and you need to understand all of the steps and sort of be involved for the entire way from before something actually gets introduced through when it gets signed into law or for a zoning board or a school board when a policy is changed and how that happens and who votes on it. So, who has the power to make the change? What system? Is it your county commission? Is it your state legislature? Is it the planning board, the zoning board, the school board? You need to, oh, could be, you know, you need something changed with law enforcement. And then that's, you know, obviously the, or the judicial system, if you, you know, want a drug court or something. You need to understand the system and who in the system has the power to help you. So, what people in the system do you need to go to to make your case that there's an issue and it needs to be addressed? So you need to build relationships with elected officials at all levels of government and in all of the different systems where you're trying to make changes and their staffs. Staff people are so important. They're the ones that do most of the work for their bosses. And so building relationships with them is incredibly important. So. You have to identify the relationships you have with your elected officials and the ones that you need, people that are in the system that maybe you've never worked with before. You need to research who your elected officials are, understand their priorities and the positions that they've taken in the past on issues related to our field and the issues that you're gonna ask them to get involved in. 
You need to know which members sit on the committees that have jurisdiction over your issue because those are the people who need to move the legislation and check to see if anyone in your coalition has a pre-existing relationship with a legislator or again, or anybody else that is in your social circle through school, church, civic stuff, who can actually get to these people to help you build relationships, get them information and set up meetings. Um, okay, develop relationships with the staff. I explained before, these guys are the gatekeepers for their bosses. But they also are the experts, as much as you can be an expert on something when you're dealing with a host of issues, they know a lot more about the issues that are under their um, purview in the office of a legislature than their bosses do. And they're the ones that brief their bosses um, about what is what the issues are and how to solve them. So you definitely want to know the staff people, um, share contact information, invite them to events. Um, and be a resource. Reach out when you have new data and not just when you need something. So it's about building relationships like you would with anyone else with legislators and their key staff. Um, again, this was connecting the dots to get people to join your sort of advocacy coalition. You need to connect the dots for your elected officials from what we're talking about, which in this case, I'm using a lot of underage drinking and alcohol examples. So why would they care? If they care about education, they should care about underage drinking because kids who use alcohol remember 10% less and don't necessarily do as well in school. Public safety, because um, binge drinking can lead to fatal car accidents. Health, because as I said before, alcohol uh, consumption can lead to a host of health issues, including a number of cancers, um, and the economy. People who tend to, um, to drink a lot, especially who binge drink, can end up causing workplace accidents and also not show up to work and not be the greatest employees sometimes. So find out what the major issues your decision makers um, care about, and then connect the dots for them to the change that you're trying to make. So specifically tailored data and messages to their priorities. So when you're doing that, you need to ask yourself, what would it take to make them care about this? Um, do you need to bring in kids who have lost um, a really good friend to a car crash because of underage drinking? Um, do you need to bring in a parent who's lost a child? Uh, what would it take to make them care? And that what would it take to make them act on, on caring? And that's when the whole community comes together with data and anecdotes and enough people who are saying that this change is critically needed and they really care about it to make elected officials know that there's real support in the community if they take this on as something that they're willing to engage in and, um, and make happen. So here are some of the facts. Underage drinking costs the United States 24.3 billion in 2010. This number hasn't been increased since then, but this is a big number. So um, we need to care about underage drinking because it's very, very costly to society and to taxpayers. Fact, excessive drinking is responsible for more than 4,300 deaths among underage um, youth every year. Again, this is relatively old information but it's extremely powerful. Uh, fact, I think we sort of just went through this. Um, yeah, here's the education one. Youth who use alcohol may remember 10% less of what they've learned than those who don't drink. And according to research, 16 to 18% of teen drinkers have missed school or work because of alcohol use. So these facts all help us make a case that underage drinking is costly and, and dangerous and really needs to be a bigger priority for decision makers. Um, and then the outcomes from the um, drug-free communities program show that communities that have drug-free communities coalitions have reduced alcohol use in their communities among youth tremendously. And even though alcohol use among 12 to 17 year olds is on a downward trajectory, um, the communities that are organized and have drug-free communities uh, coalitions 
have seen steeper reductions in underage drinking than other communities that don't have drug-free communities coalitions. Okay, I love social math techniques and I'm gonna um, just give you some examples of how to use them. They are extremely powerful. And so this is sort of putting a face on the data using the data itself. Not These are not anecdotes, this is data driven. So for social math, you can break things down um, numbers down by time. So 4,300 children under 16 start drinking every day. You can break the numbers down by place. This is the equivalent of 143 classrooms per day of new underage drinkers. You can provide comparisons with familiar things. This one is brilliant. I love it and it's very easy to do in every community. Alcohol is cheaper than milk or orange juice in our community. And that's true in a, almost the whole country at this point. You can provide ironic comparisons. There are more places to buy alcohol in our community than to buy school supplies. You can also do this for marijuana dispensaries and um, for, for other issues. And you can personalize the numbers. So the average TV watching youth saw 366 alcohol ads on TV alone in 2009. So I'd say any way that you can do social math techniques for whatever it is that you're trying to get them to understand, this really does grab people's attention and it works. So you're gonna set up meetings with the um, people who are in the system who have the power to help you. You've built your coalition, you've, picked out who the champions are, who are on the right committees or in the systems, the right people to meet with. You have to decide who are you gonna bring with you to make your case and why are you gonna bring those specific people with you? So who would you might wanna bring? One would be someone who can explain the data or is an expert on the issue. And again, they're gonna use the one pagers. You don't want someone who's going in with a doctoral dissertation because they're gonna, be lost and you get a short time in these meetings, but definitely someone who can explain your one pagers and the data. You're gonna bring the people with the anecdotes who can put a face on the data. Important allies, people who are known in the community, known in the state, people who legislators would trust and who would, they would listen to. Constituents are people who actually vote for the people that are in the system that you're going to meet with. And absolutely, I would bring youth, youth are, fantastic if they can be trained to share the data. They're fantastic with the anecdotes. They're the people who know what's going on with youth in their community. Um, they just need to be trained really well so that they get that they get a very short period of time to be able to share the information. And everyone you bring needs to have practiced beforehand. There needs to be one person leading the meeting who keeps everybody on track and on time because you get about a half an hour at most for these types of meetings, you need to sort of make your case, have them understand what it is you need and why, and then you're you're sort of out of there. Um, so you know before you go, do your homework. Um, you need to learn about who you're meeting with and understand, do they have a personal history with our issue, a family member with a substance use disorder, um, lost a child or a loved one, like Joe Biden himself did, his uh, First wife and daughter were killed by a drunk driver. It's one of the reasons he's always been a champion for our field. Do you belong to the same civic organizations as these guys? Do you have similar hobbies, children on the same sports teams? Like any connection you can think of, um, of how you can connect with these, these guys. What's their electoral history? Are they facing an election soon? Does it matter to them that they're you know, out in the community talking about an issue that people care about with their constituents? Are they on the right committee that's gonna be handling what it is you're asking them to change? Um, and have they supported anything or opposed anything that we've asked them to do or any votes that you know about in the past on especially prevention related issues? And are there other areas of interest like education, the economy, health, where you can, again, tie what we're asking for back to maybe issues that they do care about, but that they've never connected the dots for themselves and you can do that for them. So the do's and don'ts with meeting with legislators. Do be brief, as I said, you get 20 to 30 minutes at the most, even with their staff. 
Um, definitely share your expertise and your insights, but be brief. Um, highlight important facts, outcomes, and issues with your one-pagers, and always thank legislators and their staff, and always stay in touch with them after you thank them. If there's new data that comes in, send it. Again, that's all educating. You don't want to overwhelm legislators with too much information. Absolutely don't use any jargon or acronyms. Nobody knows what the SPF is. No one knows what DFC is. Uh, there's so many acronyms um, that we know and that we use that they will have no idea what we're talking about if we use them and never back anyone into a corner or ask the impossible of them. Um, and again, um, never the don't would be don't forget to thank your legislators for the meeting and their staffs even if you don't get what you want on this issue you might on a different one so keep the relationship going um keep the following in mind the reason that i've been so successful um with legislation in washington is that i do all the work for all of the offices that i am asking anything of um, the first draft of the drug-free communities legislation, I helped draft it. I drafted a lot of the STOP Act. I drafted Section 103, the Enhancement Grant in the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act. I do the work for the members so that when I'm asking them for something, I actually can give them a piece of paper that has what I'm asking for, and it's already been done. Ensure whatever you're writing is clear, concise, and understandable. Um, legislators will, legislators and their staff will ignore what they don't understand. So again, no jargon, one pagers, be really concise. Um, and, and I know when it gets to doing the work for them and providing them um, with data and talking points, that's educating. When it comes to giving them legislative language, that's moving into lobbying, but you have people in your coalitions and in your ally group that hopefully can certainly do that for you. Um, so that's that's something to keep in mind there. Um, keep the following in mind. You want good, powerful sponsors and co-sponsors on the right committees who have the power to make, introduce legislation and get it passed. Always be bipartisan. Get people from both parties um, from the very beginning. You don't want something to look like a partisan issue. Try to get as many co-sponsors as possible. The more people that sign on at the beginning, the more likely something is to happen and to move through the process. Work with your allies to gain additional co-sponsors. And again, you don't have to do all of this yourself. Um, if you can't lobby other people in your coalition or in your advocacy um, coalition can do the kind of work that maybe you can't do but it doesn't mean other people that you're working with can't do it. And if you have legislative champions, you can use them to gain additional support from their colleagues. Um, anything that you want to do legislatively in um, the zoning board, anywhere, you want to get in there and get whatever you want on the table very early in whatever the process is. Because if you go in too late, it's not going to have time to move through the process. So know the process, get in early and make your case early. Um, sort of other tips for a successful meeting and we've talked about some of this already. Designate one person to be your primary spokesperson. Let them say, okay, this person's speaking next and then go thank you next person. Be very brief with your introductions. I learned this the really hard way when I got into this field, I went to a meeting with an appropriator with very important people in our field. Now, bear in mind, you get 20 minutes for the meeting. Uh, the first person introduced themselves and then went on and on about how important they were. And then the second person had to one up that person and the third person had to one up that person. So the meeting ended and we never even got to the agenda. The whole meeting was taken up with people introducing themselves. So I learned the hard way, keep introductions really, really, really short. Um, you know, you're important enough because you're there and who your title is. And you can waste the whole meeting on introductions. Um, definitely discuss how important what you're doing is, why it works. Um, ask if you can 
build a continuing relationship with these guys and their staff. You're the experts on substance use issues. They're not. Um, so definitely try to build a continuing relationship. Um, invite youth to participate. Um, ask whoever you're meeting with the best way to provide follow-up materials. Um, invite them to speak at a coalition meeting, have a town hall meeting, build relationships with these guys where it's a win-win. Um, you don't want any of these meetings to be a one-shot thing. Um, so again, is timing critical for any system? Yeah, it is. The earlier you make your case in any process, the better, because there's more time for you to actually work with people to get done what you need to get done. So one of the most important things is have one clear ask. You don't want to go in and make your case that underage drinking is a tremendous issue and then ask for 15 different things. So therefore we need funding and we need a social health committee. And then we also need um, more underage drinking in the schools and we need the cops to do more with enforcing underage drinking laws. No, you have to go in with the one thing that you have all agreed on is your most important ask based on your analysis of your local conditions and your data. If you go in with too many asks, they're going to be totally confused about what it is you really want them to do and why. Um, it's very, very, very important to do the following analysis before you get too far in your process. You have to know who your opponent's going to be. And on underage drinking stuff, sometimes it's the alcohol industry, sometimes it's the convenience store people. Um, you know, it, it, it just depends. Um, sometimes it's parents themselves who serve alcohol to their kids and think it's fine and they'd rather the kids drank at home and you're up against um, some social norming stuff. But you really need to understand who either in the community level, the state level or the federal level are your opponents going to be and how are they going to try to defeat you? Okay, so you need to lay out all of the arguments your opponents are going to use to try to defeat you. And then you need to counter each one and work with your coalition and your advocacy coalition people to come up and figure out and talk through how are you going to counter each of the things that they're going to come up with um, to argue against what it is you're trying to accomplish. So that if the elected official says to you, but what about this group said this, you can go, well, that's actually um, not 100% accurate. We have this data. Or here we have these youth who are here to tell you that they actually are accessing a lot of alcohol from house parties so that it is very important to have a social host uh, law passed in our community. Um, just be prepared to uh, be very respectfully able to argue, um, not argue, but to diffuse anything that your opponents might have already told these people when they met with them before or any questions that might come up. So another really important thing is to go after support from those in the system who already agree with you, who you know just from their past voting record performance because you know them, or people who are undecided. So you really need to look at who is on these committees and the people you want to meet with either already agree with you or undecided. I'd say, honestly, forget about meeting with hard opponents in the system. You're not going to change their minds. A lot of times they take money from the same interests that are going to be arguing against what it is we're trying to do. And also, if you go in and meet with them, you're going to sort of give away all of your talking points so that they can go to the other side and say, oh, this is what they're arguing so that they can figure out how to argue against what you're trying to accomplish. Personally, I learned the hard way, again, going in and meeting with hard opponents, they would end up arguing with me or not paying attention to one thing that I had to say. Um, it didn't really get me anywhere, and it was somewhat of a waste of time. So I'm talking about people who you know absolutely are not going to agree with you at all. Forget it. Um, participating in advocacy efforts. Anyone can engage in advocacy, no matter how you're funded, no matter how much experience you have, because most of what I've talked about is education. Up until the point that you're asking people to um, 
<clears throat> introduce a specific piece of legislation or move through the process. <clears throat> That's all education. Anyone can do it. Um, then when it moves into the legislative process, you can do it on your own time and your own dime. And you can get other people in your advocacy coalition who actually can lobby to take, take it from there and help move it forward. You can go to a meeting where lobbying will be happening if you're there to be the person who's doing the education and then the person who makes the ask is someone else. Uh, a lot of you have probably been involved, hopefully in the work that we're doing to try to change the farm bill to, um, to make it um, basically illegal moving forward to, um, to have the synthetic cannabinoids like Delta-8, THC-0, um, Delta-10, we, we would like the definition of hemp change so that those are no longer um, under the definition of hemp, so that they would be scheduled. And in all of those meetings, we've had our coalition people explain what the substances look like, where they're sold, um, took pictures, did all of that. When it came to ask that the farm bill be changed, Chris Phoenix and I at CATCA made the ask. So they were fine on the phone. They just weren't the ones that when it moved into lobbying made the ask. They were on to do the education. And I'd say anybody can do that. Just make sure the person in the meeting who's going to make the ask is someone who actually can legally lobby. So participating in advocacy efforts, um, a low lift would be posting something on social media, participating in CATCA legislative alerts. Again, getting a legislative alert from CATCA is not lobbying. It's just you're getting something, asking you to do something. All of CATCA's legislative alerts are sent from your, you as yourself with your address as a constituent to your elected officials. So that is actually 100% allowable, doable. Everybody should do it. If you're gonna send it on to other people, probably do it from your personal email. A medium lift would be to write a letter to the editor, an op-ed, to call your member of Congress, to tell them that you care about something or to write email or fax. A little bit of a higher lift is attending a meeting with your uh, congressional members, their staffs, your city council members, um, whoever, uh, ask questions at a debate between the candidates as a concerned citizen public health and prevention expert. The more people hear on the campaign trail about an issue, the more likely they are to pay attention to it when they're elected um, and try to be invited to give testimony. Or again, if what you're working on is gonna be having a hearing, go and say, I'm here as Sutha, a resident of Chevy Chase, a concerned citizen, uh, and I'm also uh, a public health expert who cares a lot about prevention. I'm actually not here today um, as a coalition leader. So we can all do that as well. We just need to be careful how we do that. Um, ensure you testify at any hearings. This is a horrible picture of me. Chris, don't ever use this picture in the slide again. No, I'm just kidding. Um, it's really important that you do show up and if you're invited to testify in writing, by the way, that's not considered lobbying. Um, and so try to get invited to testify. Use media and social media to help make your case um, really important. Um, get people to sign on to a sign on letter. This is a great way to communicate with legislators. So Refer to your issue, keep it short, and then get as many people and groups in the community to sign on as possible. It's an easy lift for the people. You've done the work, you've written the letter, and all they have to do is sign on. If it's something that's educating them, then it's not lobbying. And if it moves into saying, like, please support or oppose, then you should probably get someone else to lead the effort to collect the signatures. Um, phone calls are a lot more difficult to ignore than emails, but if a congressional office gets seven or 10 calls on the same issue in the same couple of days. It is something that they're likely to, um, to care about. But I, I, I think it's much better to, to, to write the letters or to use um, like Cap, CAPCA's CAPWIS system um, because they count the letters and you know that it's gotten there. When you ask people to make calls, 
It's very hard to keep track of who actually did it. And unless you give everyone some sort of a script, people get sort of nervous when it comes to making the phone calls. But if you're going to do phone calls, make sure you give people the talking points to explain why the issue is important. Um, and I would follow up probably in writing, even if I did a phone call. So you have to decide after you've done all the analysis about who your opponents are going to be, uh, who your champions are, you have to decide, can you win? Can you afford to lose? Are you like going after really important industries that maybe if you go after them, they're going to try to get you defunded? So you have to decide, can you afford to lose? But the most important thing is, can you afford not to try so many of these issues? We're the only people that actually are on top of what's going on. The ones who care the most, the ones who have the data, the ones who understand. So if not us trying to get these changes that are needed at the local, state, and federal level, who's it going to be? Um, so I think everyone needs to take that into consideration when they're thinking about undertaking any sort of an advocacy effort. And then the last thing is you really need to evaluate your results. Did your meetings go well? Why or why not? Did people get off message? Did they talk too much? Were you too boring? Did you not go in with one pagers? Did you get the responses you needed in your meeting? Why or why not? And then what else do you need to do moving forward to you know, really get your issue on the radar screen of elected officials, get them to care and get them to move something forward? Um, also, did you achieve your objectives? What worked? If you didn't, did you come close to achieving your objectives and what didn't work? Um, if you didn't get what you wanted, should you try again? And I'd say all advocacy is long-term. Uh, it's very rare to get something done in one year or one session. Um, usually you do have to try again. Stuff needs to be reintroduced if a session ends. Um, so if you want to try again, when? And what would you do differently when you tried again? What did you learn from the first time that you tried to do this that maybe didn't work as well as you would have liked? And what else would you do moving forward to make sure that you have a better result the second time? Or if it did work, what is it that you learned from what you did that you would use for the next issue that you're going to have on your um, list of priorities for policy um, changes in your community? And then doing evaluation to protect your wins. This is a really great example of it. Maryland actually got an alcohol tax increase passed. 3% sales tax was passed in 2011. It was the first increase in beer and wine taxes since 1972 and in spirits, hard liquor, since 1955 in Maryland. So what did that whole group of public health and safety people do? They got some studies funded, conducted, and published that showed that sexually transmitted diseases actually went down after the Maryland um, alcohol tax increase went through. They showed that consumption among underage and other people went down after the, the tax was increased and that um, alcohol impaired driving accidents, both fatal and non-fatal went down after this 3% alcohol sales tax was implemented. So that's a really great example. Obviously they got funding to be able to do these analyses and collect the data, but it's helped them to protect that win um, and against people trying to lower alcohol taxes in Maryland again. So I'm going to stop there and uh, open it up for questions in the chat. Uh, and I, I always say, what keeps you up at night? Is there anything that's so pressing that you know you would like to to talk about it now? Chris, can you or Samantha explain um, how we're going to do the Q and A? So we do have a few questions in the Q and A, and Chris is going to read them off. And then during that time, please use your chat box of any questions you have, and I will be reading off the chat box. And then after that, we just have some updates we want to share. Um, following up with um, events coming up and the, also the evaluation link. So Chris, you want to take the lead with the well, Q&A box? Should I, 
move forward to get to the QR code. Uh, can Let, you... Let's do questions first and then QR codes. Okay, so questions first. Go ahead. Sure. So uh, the first question uh, says, thank you. Uh, my question, our local legislators are on budget, appropriations, telecommunications, and utilities, and financial institutions and insurance communities uh, committees. I am not sure how to use the specific information to help me with my prevention work. Okay, well, are there any environmental change strategies that you're specifically interested in um, accomplishing in your community, um, sort of across the continuum? Do you need funding? That would be the appropriations committee. Um, is telehealth an issue? That would be the committee that handles telehealth. So I think part of this is to figure out what it is that you want to change um, as far as policies or legislation. Do you have a social host um, ordinance in your town? If not, do you want one? Um, you know, you know, all of you do a tremendous amount of analysis when you work through the strategic prevention framework on um, what your local conditions are, what's causing them, and what needs to change. And so you need to really think through what are your top priorities. Is If you have um, marijuana legalization, is there a way to stop the density of marijuana selling outlets? I can't tell you like what it is you need to change, but if you want to make policy change um, or a school board change, maybe you live in a place that still uh, suspends and expels kids who are found vaping rather than doing in-school suspension where they actually get help and support. Uh, and their parents are called in. And um, so they actually have consequences, but they're not sent home with absolutely no support and no services. They're actually in school suspension where they're getting substance use prevention, some sort of screening, and if they needed some sort of a referral. Uh, again, I, I can't tell you what kinds of policies you need in your community, but if you need to make any policy change, this is how to do it. I don't know, Chris, if you can ask that person if that answered their question or not. Uh, unfortunately, it says anonymous attendee, so I, I can't. Oh, sorry. But if that person wants to you know, type again, we can get to your uh, follow-up question. Okay. Um, the second question is, on Hill Day, we ask for several things, funding for DFC, STOP Act, CARA, the block grant. Isn't this a contradiction of you saying we should only ask for one thing? Oh, uh, no. Uh, yeah, if you are doing a specific ask in your community to change a law or whatever, like if we were asking you to go up when we do these things on the farm bill, we're only talking about the farm bill. On Hill Day, you're meeting with people who have the power to, uh, it's right before the appropriation season, pick a number of appropriations priorities. So um, for Capitol Hill Day, you can ask for more than one thing because you're not asking for a new law and you might be asking them to sign on to a, as a co-sponsor to something. Um, but when you're going in um, with a legislative priority, like with us on trying to change the definition of hemp in the farm bill to make the synthetic cannabinoids um, illegal, we stick to that one issue in those meetings because we've set those meetings up only to talk about that one issue. When you go on Hill Day, they're expecting you to talk to them about what's going on in the community and how they can be most helpful to you in Washington. And that would be a number of things, not just one. I, I hope that I didn't confuse people, um, but I apologize if I did. It, it depends what it is your meeting's about. And if it's about, in general, how to be most helpful to help with funding for substance use prevention and make sure that it, you know, is a priority for them and approves, then telling them what funds your programs, it's that's one ask with three different sub-asks, if that makes sense. Okay, I, I hope that that answered your question. These are fabulous questions. And thank you so much. It means everyone's really listening very closely. Um, okay. 
the, the next question is, how can we convince community coalition members that something like alcohol policy is worth advocating for? We have strong norms toward drinking. Okay, that's that's a great one. Um, one is the anecdotes. It's the kids talking about going to the parties where kids are passing out, puking their guts out, driving drunk, even though they know they're not supposed to. Um, I, I think a lot of it is, um, is working with youth as spokespeople to say, hey, you know what? We really do have a problem with underage drinking here. If there's a tragedy, which God forbid, I hope that there isn't, um, with a youth um, involved in some sort of a car crash that's either fatal or kids end up really injured, um, that's usually the best opening that you're going to have to make make the case. Um, but again, I think using youth as messengers. Um, especially the youth who are seeing what's happening at these parties that maybe are not being chaperoned correctly. Um, again, that's a tough one and I, I get it. Um, the places that have done the best with that are the ones that have the data to show that there actually are implications from underage drinking, either accidents, deaths, alcohol poisonings, um, kids showing up drunk at parties, bringing alcohol and water bottles. Uh, it's the kids who can make the case, I think, the best for that. Um, it, it's a really great question, and it's a problem in a lot of places. <laughs> Jennifer asks, what, if anything, can we do to advocate for a more detailed definition of hemp for the farm bill to close the loop on THC isomers if our Congress people are not on ag committees? Uh, that's such a great question. Um, when it gets to the point that um, this is going to be voted on, we will get an alert out to everybody. So right now, everything is obviously stalled in Congress because they're waiting to um, elect a speaker. So it's been 20 days where nothing's happened. Um, so if you don't have someone on the Ag Committee, uh, we can get out all the information that we've been getting to people and you can just, I'm sorry, Samantha, did you raise your hand? Um, just to let you know, if you signed up for this uh, webinar, I will be sharing it with the policy department. And if you would, we can add you to our policy alert list, email list that the policy, send, the policy team sends out. So everyone's um, aware, especially this upcoming season. So just letting you know, we could make sure we keep this uh, conversation going and everyone has some more tips and um, conversations with our policy department moving forward. And then Chris, we can get Samantha um, the, the sign on letters that, that we've done on this issue, what we sent to the help committee. We'll get you the information that we've used to get to the Hill. And then you can tailor it and you can certainly talk to members who aren't on the ad committee and the, quest, the, the ask for them would be to get to the chairman and the ranking members to make sure that this is on their radar screen. So it's one of those things that the people who have the power to make the change right now are the people writing the bill who are on the ad committee. But as this moves, people are gonna have to vote on this and at that point, we're going to probably get a big alert out. But at this point, if you're interested, you certainly can call your two senators and um, the, your representative in the House of Representatives and tell them this is a big priority for you. And you'd really like them to talk, if they're a Republican in the House, to the chair of the committee who's from Pennsylvania. Chris can get that information to you, too. And if a Democrat, the ranking member, um, same for the Senate. So thank you for asking. We'd love all the help we can get. And Chris, I don't know if you'd like to add anything. No, Sue, I think you covered it. Um, we get out alerts all the time. We can add you to our alert lists. And uh, yeah, we're, we're grateful to all the help we can get with the farm bill work. Uh, Beverly asks, the governors of Florida and Texas eliminated all state offices on diversity, equity, and inclusion, which impacts all funding, including the prevention set aside. Cultural competency is core to the SPF and DFC, and we must be mindful of providing culturally comp uh, culturally competent responses. Any suggestions to combat this? 
Okay, so this was something that was done in the legislative, excuse me, in the executive branch, if it was done in governor's offices. Um, well, you can try to talk to the legislator, legislature because obviously they pass the laws and if they pass a law that says that diversity, equity, and inclusion um, needs to be included in state funding, hard to do. Um, I, I think you can, you know, maybe get people together to explain to whoever made that decision um, in the governor's office um, or in your single state agency for uh, alcohol and drugs and mental health, how this is impacting communities' abilities to be able to actually do the best work that they possibly can do. Um, that can work. Uh, maybe start talking to your national prevention network person. They work for the governor. Um, yeah, that that's a that's a sort of a tough one. I think <laughs> first you'd have to understand why they got why they got rid of it in the first place. Did they claim that it wasn't science based or evidence based? I don't know, but I try to find out who made the decision, why the decision was made. You can always do a Freedom of Information Act request to find out who made the decision and what it was based on. And then once you have that information, figure out who the best people to get together would be to try to meet with someone in the governor's office to explain that you think this was a mistake. Um, I'd probably bring, you know, people from the NAACP, um, you know, uh, other groups who are not in our field who can you know make the case that this was a mistake but that that's a really great question thank you and we can talk offline more about that if you'd like to go ahead chris another question uh christina asks regarding something like kratom there is not enough data to show the harm our local representative in ohio has introduced a regulatory bill while a ban is preferred do you have suggestions for how to provide data on something like Kratom where not much exists? Um, yeah, that that's a great a great question. I think let let's look at other places that have banned it um, and see what kind of legislation they've gotten introduced and what they've based it on. Um, NIDA has some information. On Kratom, probably the DEA does as well. Um, I'm not an expert on Kratom. Samantha, I think at one point we um, we did something on Kratom at CATGA. I don't know if you were there when we did it. I can't recall if it was a session or if it was just a featured article, but I think in the last few years we have done something um, just because especially on the East Coast, it's been very popular. So maybe we can find what we have done at CADGA on Kratom in the past, and uh, Samantha can get that out to all the, if, if people are interested in, or can you get it directly to the person who asked the question if they put their contact in the chat? I would suggest everyone has my email because there has been reminders and um, just the invite overall. Just if you have any questions, and this is a general, whatever anyone might have, just reach out to me and I could... Uh, give you a tailored answer and do some research after the webinar. Oh, and I have an idea for you. If you're in the CATGA community, please put that question in the CATGA community so that everyone else who's a coalition on the community can tell you what they've done, if anything, on Kratom, where they found the information, what it is that they helped get past. I, I, this is a great one for the CATGA community. Uh, John said, go to your local medical examiner and ask about deaths. So that's a, just as a starting point. So, yeah. Uh, Judy asks, can you send this out to everyone? Samantha? If it's the Wednesday webinar, I know I put the link out. Um, so every Wednesday webinar we have is on the website. I can put in the link again. And you will also see the upcoming the upcoming Wednesday webinar, which is November 8th, and that's going to be on coalition leadership. And then the next one after that, it's going to be don't leave your business to chance the first week of December. So I'll put in the link for the Wednesday webinar page and then also our next Wednesday webinar. And we also encourage you to please evaluate this session either by going to the link that's at the bottom of the slide there or scanning the QR code with your cameras or your phone's camera.
Okay, before we end, I want to say um, my team at CATCA, myself, Chris, and Phoenix provide a tremendous amount of one-on-one -on -one technical assistance to people who are trying to get policy change made to talk about where the line is, how to do it, how to do it when you're a DFC. Um, we look at one pagers and change the wording so that they go from to education from maybe having crossed the line. We can help you strategize on, you know, some of the questions that you've asked because I have a lot of contacts. If I don't know something, I can reach out to NIDA, to NIAAA, to DEA. Um, so please do use the public policy team at CATCA as a resource if you'd like to, because we really do love providing technical assistance specifically to people who ask us for our help. And uh, I, drop, I dropped our uh, department email in the chat. It is publicpolicy at catca.org. Uh, if you have questions, if you need technical assistance, uh, Phoenix or I monitor that inbox and we'll get back to you. And then before we all hop off, I just want to make a plug for Capitol Hill Day. Uh, it's a huge part of our forum. It's on January 31st, 2024. And the uh, meetings are all going to be in person for the first time since 2020. Uh, so please... Sign up for that. Sign up for the whole forum. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all uh, in January. And if I can just end on that note, thank you, Chris. Um, every champion that we have at the federal level, we have gotten through you guys going to Capitol Hill on Capitol Hill Day and meeting with your senators and your representatives. Um, you know, interestingly, in Vermont, Cindy Hayford would go up with a group of people every year um, to see Senator Leahy. He just retired last year, but he ended up the chair of the full appropriations committee. And he knew all of these people from Vermont personally, he saw them every single year. And so he became a gigantic champion for our stuff. In fact, President Biden had been our probes champion uh, because people in Delaware went to him. And when he became vice president, this is unheard of, but Senator Leahy's office called us and asked if he could take over as the champion for the Drug Free Communities Program because of Cindy Hayford and all of the amazing coalitions in Vermont going up and seeing him every year on Hill Day. It makes a gigantic difference in almost every amazing champion we've had. We've gotten out of you guys doing Capitol Hill Day every year. So uh, put a plug in to say, that's why we have our funding. That's why we are sort of doing so well with you know, the farm bill stuff, it's because it's you guys willing to hop on a call and do the education uh, and get involved. So I want to say thank you to everyone for participating. Um, obviously, I love the public policy stuff, and hopefully you will all love to grow to love it as well, if you don't already. And uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Samantha to close out. So thank you all. Um, I encourage everyone. I put the forum link if you would like to see Sue speak again, if you would like to learn more about um, what our policy team offers, um, learn more about, about our Capitol Hill Day that the policy team leads and we champion each year, please reach out. I have the link again in the chat. Everyone has my email. If you have any follow-up questions, please do not be afraid to ask. Again, I will be sharing these emails with the policy team so people can be added to our alert system. And again, um, we'll be having our next Wednesday webinar. November 8th, it's going to be effective coalition leadership. I encourage everyone to attend and just thank you all for attending. And thank you, Sue. You're amazing. You're definitely no, you're amazing. Welcome. And I just want to say thank you, Chris. Phoenix isn't here this week. He's actually off playing golf, but I have an amazing team at Katka and um, we're, we're here to help and we're here to serve you. So thank you to everybody. And it's been a pleasure.